Hi, I'm Sarah Van Tassel. I'm at Wall Cornell in New York City, and I'm just delighted to be speaking with this group on the topic of diagnostics and drug delivery, what the future holds. I do have financial disclosures listed here. And as you know, I, the glaucoma space continues to be flooded with new diagnostics and new therapeutics, and we're going to review um, options that are existing that you might want to integrate to your practice, but that are on the new side, and also some pipeline options. And I hope at the completion of this course, you'll be able to describe and hopefully utilize some of these new and future diagnostic innovations, as well as describe new and emerging intraocular pressure lowering medications and also strategies. So first, let's start with diagnostics. Intraocular pressure, perhaps the most important diagnostic that we use in glaucoma. Home tonometry is one of the really big innovations in glaucoma and in IOP in general, and has really just been around for the last five or six years. Um, this home tonometer shown here first became available to patients in 2017 and allows for patients to measure their IOP outside of office hours rather than doing a serial IOP lowering or IOP checks um, throughout the day. And it has the added benefit that they can check at night, which unless you're admitting someone to the hospital is really challenging to do. The results are uploaded to a cloud, uh, but they're not visible on the device to the patient, which has pros and cons. Patients, of course, want to know. They want the instant gratification. Um, but as providers, we don't really want those phone calls uh, that the pressure is too high or too low. And so you have a lot of control as the prescribing user um, about what you give access to the what, what access you give to the patients in terms of the cloud um, and whether or not they can see their pressure. And this is a rebound tonometer, which we're all familiar with, and you probably use in your clinics already. And so no anesthetic is required. And I've found that the home tonometer guides my decision-making process in two primary ways. One is for patients where they're progressing. And you say, is this patient progressing despite the IOP goal, meaning they're, you know, they're at your goal, but they're getting worse. You really want to lower the pressure. That's sort of the one fork in the road, or um, perhaps more probable, are they higher at certain times of day that you're not capturing in the office? And if that's the case, what can you do to mitigate those peaks? Can you change the timing of the eye drops? Can you add SLT? Do they need a surgery? And so this is um, really where we think about how to use the device. Is it someone who's um, at their IOP and they're getting worse, or is it someone who's really not at their IOP, but you thought they were? And there's a new version um, just released that looks more like this compared to the first picture. So this is the sort of the beta version number two. And the updated features are that patients can check their IOP in multiple positions, um, supine or reclined. And the mobile app allows compatibility both with, uh, for Mac users and with an Android, which is an improvement. So here's my experience using um, this home tonometer. This is a patient who owns the device and I do both rent them and sell them. And um, she's obviously very dedicated to checking her pressures. So we have here on this sheet, her pressure starting in November of 2020 um, through a few weeks ago. And you get this summative data, um, the peak pressure in both eyes, the low pressure, the lowest pressure in both eyes, the va values that you see there, 12 and 15.1 and are the average IOPs over this time period in the right and left eyes, and then the standard deviation. And so this is a woman who actually had surgery um, in her right eye, the blue. And so you'll see her peak pressure um, right here. Um, that was in her kind of early post-operative period, but really her, her right eye, the blue has stayed um, at goal. And it's actually her left eye that has been um, the one we're focusing on recently because she hasn't had surgery, doesn't really have damage. And the question is, is her ocular hypertension acceptable? And so I will be seeing her in a few weeks and we can discuss the elevation in her pressure, sort of this upward trend and decide how to proceed. But this is someone for whom owning the device has really been helpful because she winters away from me. She doesn't want to see a second provider. And so this has really provided us um, some freedom to manage her IOP remotely. So who are the best candidates for home tonometry? Patients need to be highly motivated. And I have found that 
that's important, whether they're renting the device or purchasing the device, they need to be motivated because the training can be challenging and also because they need to continue to use it either for the prescribed period of time or perhaps indefinitely. And they need to be sufficiently sighted to see the device and the cues for alignment. The only patient that I have had fail the training for how to use the device was a woman whose glaucoma was so severe um, and her islands were so small that as the device approached her eye, the target for where she needed to look actually exited her sort of fixation circle. And so she really could never use sufficient tactile cues to align the device. Um, obviously, because of the work that's required, both for the provider and for the patients, um, I think it's important that their disease is progressing and you're considering some kind of escalation of treatment. If someone is stable, knowing whether or not they're high at home doesn't provide a whole lot of value. And, and at present, we really don't even know what to do with that information because no doubt there are a lot of stable patients in our practices who are in fact higher than our target at, at certain hours of day at home. And then I added here as an asterisk, it's important that patients can afford either the rental or the purchase. This is sort of a challenging gray area because there are now some codes that allow for billing of remote monitoring and of the training, um, but the reimbursements are pretty low and this process is fairly intensive. So you have to decide what makes most sense for you and for your practice. Um, but in my practice, this is a um, an outside of insurance that we do the rentals and, and of course the purchases, which are always outside of insurance. And so um, affording the device can be a limitation. And if you don't own the device um, and don't want to, or, or I want to experiment with how to utilize this in your practice, um, this website, myeyes.net is just really fantastic. Um, it's essentially sort of a durable medical equipment type model in the same way that you might prescribe a walker for patients or a wheelchair or crutches, you can prescribe the eye care home. And then this company takes care of all of it, the training for the patient, how to use it. They get the device to the patient. They help them use it for the specific period of time, or they sell them the device if you like. Um, and then you will get the results of the experience when the patient was at home and measuring their pressure. So Something to keep in mind if you're excited to dabble in this space, home tonometry. Another innovation in intraocular pressure measurement is um, this tonometer. And you might think, well, what could possibly be new about Goldman tonometry? Um, but this is the correcting applanation tonometry surface tonometer. And it's pictured here. And, and one of the publications about it is included here. Um, but it looks like a Goldman tonometer and it acts like one. You can utilize it in your slit lamp without recalibration. And the idea is that it reduces the corneal biomechanical sensitivity. So if corneal hysteresis and some of the other corneal um, bio properties are something you have followed with interest, then this might be something you want to utilize in your practice because the, um, the sinusoidal shape of this device actually helps to neutralize some of those corneal properties because of the way that it matches the curvature of the cornea. And so in a sense, you get kind of a pure um, Goldman pressure um, and it's, you know, it, it meets the calibration um, or the, the FDA like recommendation in terms of how closely it follows um, Goldman tonometry, but it, it's a slightly different number. So something to think about and fairly new, but available. And then um, transitioning, transitioning to things that aren't available, um, you know, intraocular IOP measurement is really sort of the future, I think, of IOP. Um, but these devices, by and large, are in development or available elsewhere, but not in the U.S. And so there are a few examples. Pictured here is the iMate. Um, it is CE approved and it's implanted during cataract extraction. So the intraocular lens goes into the bag and then this device goes into the iridociliary sulcus. And it does um, measure the IOP, but you need this reader in order to be able to do that. So it's the shape of a deck of cards or so and you hold it up to the eye. And while the reader is around the device, you're able to measure the pressure um, 
but not at other times. So certainly this makes it a little bit more challenging to get um, you know, a multitude of overnight pressures, for example, because the patient would then have to set an alarm um, and check it throughout the night. But motivated patients um, can do that. And the uh, beta version of this device has haptics and will be a little bit more stable in the iridociliary sulcus. Um, so perhaps we will see this in the US at some point in the future or, or an iteration of it. Um, as a variation on a theme, the InjectSense is an injectable IOP sensor, and it doesn't need the reader. So it's this uh, pictured here next to a, a grain, of, a quarter dollar, but then also a grain of rice is that little white thing. And so you can see that this is quite small, um, but is able to transmit the IOP signal without the reader. So something like this perhaps might be available in the future. And then there's a third similar device um, that actually gets implanted into the supra, suprachoroidal space and then has sort of like a little flag into the anterior chamber um, that also measures IOP. So at some point in my practice lifetime, I think we will see intraocular IOP measurements. And I certainly hope we do, um, but none of this is ready for prime time. So that concludes IOP measurements in terms of diagnostics. And so I wanna transition into OCT and I'm gonna start with the role of ganglion cell imaging. The ganglion cell layer is not new per se, but when I see consultations from um, you know, outside practices, I continue to see that many, many providers aren't obtaining the ganglion cell layer routinely as part of their OCT. And I think in 2022, uh, getting both the RNFL and the ganglion cell um, images is really the standard of care. So I wanna show an example or a few examples here of why this uh, can be incorporated into your practice and should be incorporated into your practice if you're not using it yet. This is a patient um, who was sent to me for a question of glaucoma suspect. And obviously you can see they have large cups and there's this suspicious inferior thinning of the peripapillary uh, or circumpapillary retinal nerve fiber layer in both eyes. But it's easy to look at this and say, you know, most of the um, quadrants are in the green. Maybe this is just physiologic cupping. And in this particular patient, it's really the ganglion cell analysis that gives away the diagnosis. You see these arcs of inferior tissue loss and, and ganglion cell loss. And really there's no disease that causes this pattern of ganglion cell atrophy other than glaucoma. So you can be extremely confident that this patient has glaucoma because you got the ganglion cell analysis. And then taking this one level further, if you happen to be a serious user, you can actually stitch these images together in what's called the panomap. And so you see here that the computer essentially is able to stitch this area of ganglion cell loss together with the circumpapillary RNFL scan. And so you see um, this whole arc of atrophied tissue and you can you know, imagine the visual field defects on this patient as well. And in contrast, this is a patient with a, a very similar retinal nerve fiber layer, frankly, um, not altogether different, also cupped and some mild RNFL thinning. But in a patient like this, when you see the ganglion cell analysis, you can be confident that this patient certainly doesn't have fixation, fixation threatening glaucoma. And you can be fairly confident that they really don't have glaucoma at all. If they do, um, you know, it's far, far outside um, what you would capture in a Humphrey 24-2 visual field. And this is someone you can follow um, more confidently as a glaucoma suspect due to their cupping. And then finally, a third example, another patient sent to me as a glaucoma suspect. And you can see here that this RNFL thinning is quite unusual looking, though not frankly um, glaucomatous in its appearance. And what the macula shows here is that this patient has retrograde transsynaptic degeneration uh, from a large MCA stroke, actually. And so you can see that this is really a neurological um, OCT defect, and they have the atrophy of the ganglion cells, corresponds to their RNFL loss, as you can see here in the panel maps. Um, and this tracks you know, all the way back past their lateral genicular nucleus. And then I just wanted to point out here, I'm primarily a serious user, but if you're not, certainly you can do this on the Heidelberg. You can do something similar on the OptiView. Here I'm showing um, progressive RNFL loss and then this arc of tissue in red down here 
um, which corresponds to the ganglion cell atrophy and, and change over time in this patient with glaucoma who was undergoing Heidelberg scans or you know, on the um, spectralis. Um, transitioning to anterior segment OCT, you know, I include this as something new because increasingly it's on all the machines as something that's available to us and patients and providers ask about it a lot. But in my practice, gonioscopy remains the gold standard for angle assessment. And I think there is little you can do that will benefit your patients and your practice more than becoming just an outstanding gonioscoper, um, because there's really so, so much that you can see by actually looking at the angle, whether that's diagnosing subtle pigment dispersion or pseudoexfoliation, where you see some of that flaky debris in the angle that wasn't that visible on the lens capsule or you know, areas of PAS, all of which is extremely challenging, if not impossible to see on the anterior segment OCT. Nonetheless, I think there is a growing role for anterior segment OCT. And in particular, I wanted to highlight one study, which was an analysis from the ZAP trial. And they looked at 643 Chinese patients um, and, and eyes who had untreated primary angle closure suspects. So they were narrow, occludable, but didn't have glaucoma. And the primary focus of this particular paper was to identify biometric risk factors that predicted progression from angle closure suspect to either primary angle closure glaucoma or acute angle closure. And what they found is that 34 of the eyes progressed in this way from angle closure suspect to primary angle closure or acute angle closure glaucoma. And in their multivariate models, anterior segment OCT predicted um, or, or demonstrated that the parameters of a narrower horizontal angle opening distance from the scleral spur and a flatter horizontal iris curvature were significantly associated with progression. And so I highlight this because I think it demonstrates that anterior segment OCT may have a role in determining the risk of progression from angle closure suspect into acute angle closure um, or primary angle closure glaucoma. But these aren't parameters that we can easily capture in a patient-specific way that really changes the way we might manage uh, patients sitting in our chair. And so I think until we know how anterior segment OCT really allows us to do that, um, it's really more of an interesting phenomenon or an interesting test, um, but one that really shouldn't replace gonioscopy in your practice. And I would say that there are similar things that could be said about OCT angiography, which is also um, new and widely available now on the various OCT machines. Um, and you know, how does this work? It's essentially taking um, two scans or multiple scans in quick succession. And whereas things like the retinal nerve fiber layer don't change over time, the movement of blood through blood vessels does change rapidly over time. And so the machine, the software is able to see that movement or change in between the images and do some fancy calculations to show us where the blood vessels are in particular layers of the macula or the circumpapillary retina. And obviously this is just fantastic in its uh, ingenuity and, and, and it's then the technology, um, but it's, it's not something that's readily implementable in clinical practice as yet. Um, we don't have the, the normative data to know, um, you know what patients fall outside of the normal range. But the research demonstrates that there's a tremendous amount of promise. This might show us earlier disease, um, patients where the blood flow show that there are areas of damage that haven't, you know, ganglion cell damage, for, exa for example, but not yet ganglion cell death. And could we rescue those patients and that tissue by implementing treatment early? Maybe. Um, similarly, in severe, severe disease where the OCT really is no longer valuable because you're at the floor, um, perhaps some of this blood flow can show us continued progression that would warrant treatment over time. So I think this is exciting, um, but not, not readily implementable into clinical practice as yet. And then transitioning into perimetry, another important um, part of our diagnostics. Uh, home perimetry is a new innovation, and there are really two main types, web-based software and virtual reality headsets like the one shown here. 
Web-based software might have a role um, in the developing world or for certain patients and providers during the pandemic, but really isn't the same as Humphrey Perimetry. However, virtual reality headsets are becoming um, really close to being very similar to Humphrey Perimetry. So they may benefit patients who can't position easily. Um, studies are evaluating home use. And the close correlation with Humphrey, Humphrey perimetry um, in eyes with and without glaucoma really allows for what will hopefully be a seamless um, transition or sort of seamless use, um, both in office and home settings of devices like this. And by and large, they're about $1,000. So um, certainly some practices own these, people are starting to utilize them. Um, but I think we're going to see more and more utilization of virtual reality headsets um, moving forward, especially as it becomes easier and easier to just snap a smartphone into them and whatnot. And then finally, I want to talk about digital optic nerve photography. Um, these are all examples of um, images taken with an iPhone and a 20 diopter lens. So you can see the 20 diopter lens here. And um, if you're not doing this, it's kind of a cool way to take photos um, in certain resource limited settings. In particular, my residents do this in the inpatient setting for consultations. And that's where these photos all come from. But this is super low tech. I mean, it's essentially a magnifying glass, a glorified magnifying glass and an iPhone, and you can get um, pretty interesting pictures. And so the question is, you know, can you do this as a selfie? Um, and different groups have shown that you can um, with variable amounts of additional equipment. You can see an image here from the journal Ophthalmology uh, of a physician capturing their own, um, own photo. Um, and I think the, the question is, is something like this going to be available for patients or for at home or when someone calls and says they have flashes and floaters, can we help them take a photo on an iPhone? Uh, perhaps, I think that there are a lot of challenges. Quality certainly will be a challenge. Whether or not special equipment is required is limiting. Um, you know, is, does the patient need to be dilated? Are there wide field capabilities? And then perhaps most troublesome is that, um, or, or, or most limiting is that AI or computer analysis programs, artificial intelligence that is, may be needed to help screen and sort the high volume of photos that would be produced if this was available in patients' hands. I mean, you can only imagine um, the Instagram ability of the you know, tens of thousands of fundus photos that would emerge and, and there aren't enough of us to screen them all. And so many groups, um, including my own, are, are trying to look at how, um, how do we develop um, machine learning or computer analysis programs that can look at images or in this case, look at images for change. And so I think we will see that in our practice lifetimes. And so what are the needs for the future in the diagnostic space? You know, we really need improved diagnostics for outflow mapping. Um, this is from Alec, Alex Wong's work, and he's done a lot to show um, the drainage system. But if we knew where, um, you know, what collector channels were working, which ones aren't, which ones are revivable, which ones aren't, this would really change the way we think about SLT. It would change the way that we think about surgical interventions. And so when we look at the various, um, you know, photos and OCTs and whatnot, this is a space where we need more outflow mapping. Um, we need improved decision support software, whether that's artificial intelligence related so much to what I showed you or some other type of algorithm. Um, that's an important diagnostic need for the future. And then something we didn't discuss here, but I think is intimately related to diagnostics is that we need to have an improved understanding of how genetics intersect with individual patient risk. And so this, and these are the future needs for diagnostics, though certainly the things that we have already are really exciting. And then I wanna transition for the latter half of my talk into drug delivery and IOP lowering. And so when you think about innovations in drug delivery, we are very often talking about sustained release medications. So why do we need sustained release medications? We know that eye drop use poses problems. Uh, Non-compliance is high, anywhere from about five to 80%, depending on the study. We know that midday doses are particularly vulnerable, and this, of course, is a major issue with the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors if you're prescribing them as a three times daily medication. 
Drops can be difficult to instill. And patients are often forgetful. They complain that drops can be inconvenient. There are cost issues, side effects, travel, scheduling, denial, depression. And then of course, an additional challenge is the peaks and troughs associated with dosing that when you give the medication, the pressure is lower, but the eye pressure rises um, before the, the next dose is due. And we also know that while we would like laser and surgical therapies to be you know, good for all patients, that isn't the case. Some patients have already had SLT or surgery. Some patients have ankle anatomy that's not really amenable to SLT. Patients can be resistant to this type of escalation of therapy. And we know that medical comorbidities like positioning at the laser or getting cleared for surgery um, can be limitations for some patients. And so we do have one commercially available sustained release medication for glaucoma, and that's the bimatoprost sustained release intracameral implant. It was first approved by the FDA in March 2020, and it's a 10 microgram dose of bimatoprost, um, the indication for which is to lower IOP in eyes with open angle glaucoma or ocular hypertension. And we know from the clinical trial data that the implant was non-inferior to Timolol through 12 weeks, and that the mean IOP reduction was consistent from week 12 to from week two to week 12, that is, and was about 7.7 millimeters of mercury in the sustained release bimatoprost group that got the 10 microgram dose, which was ultimately the approved dose, um, compared to 7.1 milligrams of mercury for patients who were on Timolol twice daily. And when we look at the phase one and phase two clinical trial data of patients who got just one implant, which is how, the, how it's approved for use, we know that 62% of patients made it to six months without rescue, and about 29% of patients made it to 12 months without rescue, and then a quarter of patients made it to 24 months with no rescue. So we know that if you made it to 12 months with only one implant in the eye, you were very likely to make it all the way to two years, which is pretty incredible from having just one sustained release implant in the eye. And in the eyes that made it to 24 months, the average IOP reduction was about 7.4 millimeters of mercury, um, which compared to about 8.2 millimeters of mercury in the topical bimatoprost group. And we know that there is a lot of research going on with the bimatoprost implant because um, you know, we all want to know um, what types of glaucoma is it best for? How does it compare to other medications? How does it compare to laser therapy? Um, what are the different dosing regimens? Should a patient get just one? Should they get three in a row as was done in, um, in the approval clinical trial? Um, so a lot is on the horizon in terms of what we're going to learn about sustained release medication and in particular the bimatoprost implant. We also know that the pipeline for sustained release medications is really robust. Candidate systems include punctal plugs, ring type systems, almost like a procura ring kind of, um, contact lenses, implants, microspheres, nanospheres, and gels. And we know that determinants of commercial success will include things like efficacy, duration, safety, cost and reimbursement, patient acceptance, and the ease or the office flow in terms of you know, how do we do this logistically. Um, two specific things that are on the horizon, there's the IDOS, which is a titanium implant that releases Travaprost directly into the anterior chamber. And it has sort of two pieces, an anchor device, and then the actual reservoir and the anchor is left in place, but the reservoir can be exchanged um, once the drug is depleted. And then there's also an intracameral Travaprost implant and innumerable other things. And, and we know that this is going to happen because not only do we have the intracameral bimatoprost implant, but we've seen other things into the market. Um, steroids in particular, we now have the intracanalicular steroid implants. We have post-operative intracameral steroid options. So I think the future is bright and this pipeline is very real in terms of what we're going to see in the years ahead for sustained release. And I want to talk um, sort of a play on words, drug delivery. I want to talk about something that isn't sustained release, and that is um, prescribing medications that aren't available at sort of standard pharmacies. 
if this isn't something you're doing, it can really make a big difference for your patients and for your ease of office flow. And there are several different medications for which this is relevant. Preservative-free latanoprost, which is an excellent preservative-free option for patients who need it, is only available at these two pharmacies, um, Capstan RX and Transition Pharmacy. And so you send it electronically to those pharmacies and then the patients know what they're going to pay for either the one month supply or the three month supply. Um, and then it's delivered to their home. You can similarly do this um, for preservative free dorsolamide timolol, for preservative free tafluprost and for branded timolol at um, Eagle Pharmacy. And similarly, this is outside insurance, um, but patients pay these prices for you know, one, two, or a three month supply. And so this is an alternate way to deliver medications to patients and is particularly good for patients who really need preservative free medications, which can be wildly expensive um, at their standard pharmacy, depending on their coverage. Um, and then going one step further, if you really want sort of unique combinations of drops that aren't available commercially, like timolol, bromonidine, and dorzolamide in the same bottle, preservative-free, or you want preservative-free dorzolamide timolol, as an, or dorzolamide, that is, as an example, which isn't available at pharmacies, then there are online um, compounding pharmacies that you can use to get these multiple preservative-free options or these unique combinations. And so why would you think about these kind of outside the box pharmacies for your patients? There's no prior authorizations. There are no callbacks. There's no unmet deductibles. Patients always get the medication that you prescribed. There are no these wild substitutions that sometimes happen at pharmacies. And this is highly customizable and there's pricing transparency. So it may not be the cheapest option, um, but patients, many patients really value knowing out of the gate what they're going to pay. So this is sort of a, a new-ish type of drug delivery that you might want to dabble in if you're not using. And then an entirely different type of delivery, so to speak. Um, I want to speak about mindfulness meditation. And um, you might think, well, that, that really doesn't sound like drugs at all, but bear with me. So and this is a particularly interesting study of 60 patients um, whose IOP was above goal and they were on maximally tolerated medical therapy and scheduled for trabeculectomy. And these 60 patients were randomized to three weeks of meditation in addition to their existing IOP therapy regimen or IOP therapy alone. And what happened at three weeks was that in the meditation group, the IOP had decreased from about 20 to about 15. And in the control group that was just using their eye drops, it's no surprise that the IOP was stable, about 20 or 21. And in fact, the pressure lowering was so convincing that 15 eyes in the intervention group, the meditation group, um, actually avoided trabeculectomy um, because their IOP was less than 15 and they were followed out to nine weeks and, and still hadn't needed trabeculectomy. And the authors of this study quote this, um, or use this quote, they say, the moment you change your perception is the moment you rewrite the chemistry of your body. And so the question is, what chemistry is changing from mindfulness meditation? And so what these um, authors or investigators did was they took the trabecular meshwork specimens at the time of trabeculectomy and they did gene expression studies on that tissue. And they found that there was an upregulation of NOS3 and NOS1 in the meditation group. And these enzymes are responsible for um, increasing nitric oxide in the anterior chamber. And in particular, in endothelial NOS3 causes an increase in trabecular meshwork outflow. And they also observed an upregulation of neuroprotective genes and with downregulation of pro-inflammatory genes. And so you might think, well, does this really make sense? Upregulation of nitric oxide and, and are there other places in the literature where we see this as playing a role in glaucoma? And the answer is yes. We know that dietary intake of dietary intake of nitrates um, is important for for glaucoma prevention or glaucoma risk reduction. We know from the nurse's health study and the health professions follow-up study 
that patients who had high dietary nitrate intake, which is the largest dietary nitrates are the largest source of exogenous nitric oxide. They had a lower risk of primary open angle glaucoma, and in particular, a lower risk of early paracentral visual field loss um, than, than patients who had low dietary intake. And the dietary source of nitrate is primarily leafy green vegetables. And we also know that nitric oxide has an important role because of course, nitric oxide is one of the active ingredients along with latanoprost acid in latanoprostine bunode. And so it seems that um, mindfulness meditation is changing the chemistry of the eye and essentially delivering nitric oxide. That's my connection for drug delivery. Um, to the eye in a way that can be effective in lowering intraocular pressure. So obviously mindfulness meditation isn't a substitute um, for IOP lowering therapy, but I think as we look to the future and future innovations, we are going to see growth in sort of the holistic patient-centered space in terms of what can patients be doing um, to lower their IOP. And it looks like maybe stress reduction um, is among the things that will have a role in that. And then finally, I want to touch briefly on selective laser trabeculoplasty. Again, not a technique for drug delivery, but it does deliver IOP lowering to our patients. Um, and obviously selective laser trabeculoplasty itself is not, um, is not new. It's been around now for a couple of decades. But what we've seen in the last few years is a resurgence of enthusiasm for SLT in large part because of the light trial data. And so the American Academy of Ophthalmology has changed the preferred practice patterns to highlight the role of using SLT early. Um, but what I really wanted to highlight was these new NICE guidelines. NICE is the National Institute for Health and Care Excellent in the UK. And I think these um, guidelines really go the distance to not just say that SLT can be used as first-line therapy, but to actually say that SLT should be used as first-line therapy. Um, the guideline says that a patient with newly diagnosed open angle glaucoma um, should, should have SLT discussed with them as a first-line therapy, and that you would offer prostaglandin analogs as a first-line therapy only if SLT is not suitable, or if the patient wishes not to have SLT, or if the patient is waiting for SLT but needs treatment in the interim. So I think um, in terms of looking to the future, we're going to continue to see emphasis on SLT. A lot of um, trials now are comparing therapies to SLT, which is exciting. And I think that um, the societies and the guidelines are are moving in the direction of emphasizing the role of SLT early. And I offer SLT as a first-line therapy to all of my newly diagnosed patients and to all patients who come to me on one or two drops from another provider. Obviously the patient gets to decide, but I think SLT is a tremendously effective first-line therapy. And I think um, the opportunity to be off drops or to be on fewer drops as a result of SLT is tremendous. And obviously SLT isn't in everyone's um, scope of practice. And so I think having relationships with, um, you know, bi-directional relationships with providers um, so patients can get SLT and then go back from whence they came is super, super important um, in terms of making sure that people who need SLT can get SLT. So in conclusion, as I emphasized, this is an exciting time in glaucoma. Um, we're seeing new innovations um, that are both ready for clinical practice, our clinical practices, and also innovations that are in the pipeline that are very exciting. And I think the fact that glaucoma care is evolving so rapidly is one of the reasons that it's so exciting to practice glaucoma. And, um, and it really shows that the future of glaucoma care is extremely bright. So thank you for your time and attention, and I'll look forward to discussing. Hi, Dr. Van Tassel. Thank you so much for that amazing lecture on what we can expect for the future and really some of the things that we can use currently to manage our glaucoma patients, not only from the diagnostic side, but also from the treatment side. And so I want to jump right in over the last 10 minutes here with some questions for you. And I think the first question I want to ask you is there was a lot of chatter and discussion in the chat box about at-home 
IOP measurements and, and how we utilize that. Can you just kind of tell us in your practice how you're implementing that or, or mainly what type of patient types you're using that particular technology in? Yeah, thank you for having me. I, you know, I agree. Home pressure measurement is such an important um, topic and, and really pretty new, even though it's been around now for a couple of years. And I think it's a hard thing to discuss with patients sometimes because we've been telling patients for decades now that measuring their pressure two, three, four times a year in the office is sufficient for disease management. And even though from a provider perspective, we see this and we think, wow, this is such a hot thing. I think it's a real paradigm shift to explain to patients now, oh, we, we were doing it this way and now we wanna do it this way. Um, but when you introduce it to patients, some people are really enthusiastic. And I think those are the patients for whom this can potentially be appropriate. It's um, not super easy to do, although the, the beta, the new one is a little easier to use, but I think um, motivated patients are key. So if you introduce it to a patient and they're not that excited, that's probably not the person that's gonna make it a success for them. Um, but I think patients in particular that are progressing at a seemingly low IOP where you're thinking about making a pretty major therapeutic intervention or potentially a referral or surgery, um, those are people for whom it can really be a game changer. And it's gone both ways for me. I've had people where they were low and progressing and they were in fact high on eye care um, home measurements um, and have had other patients where surprisingly they weren't spiking. And so, you know, if your pressure is truly eight all the time and you're getting worse, you're not necessarily a surgical candidate. It's hard to do better than eight. So um, those are great candidates. And I think also it can help with compliance. I had a young patient with um, bad, bad steroid induced glaucoma from his vernal keratoconjunctivitis. And um, he was a really spotty drop user, um, but really kind of a tech junkie and took it home for a week. And um, really saw the difference that using his drops makes. And I think that has been a game changer for him. So there are a lot of appropriate patients and um, I'm loving it. I think, you know, the takeaway for me from, from your conversation, that conversation there, but also during your lecture is that, you know, just like with treatment options, we need to offer things for our patients or have discussion. We need to educate them on diagnostic technologies as well. And yeah. thank you for outlining all those different patient types because, that's the hardest part is kind of identifying what patients will this be helpful in. So thank you for that. Yeah. Another question for you into the treatment realm, you know, glaucoma drug delivery, we're hearing a lot about it. There's some exciting technologies coming, but we have one on the market right now, which is bimetoprost SR. So along the same lines as the, the, the home tonometry advice, uh, device, what type of patient types are you utilizing something like bimetoprost SR in your practice with? Yeah, I think for me, the, the two most common indications are bad ocular surface disease or bad forgetfulness. <laughs> and there are um, reasons for, for the latter, uh, which are myriad. But, you know, for, for um, the patients who have bad ocular surface disease, it can really be a game changer um, because they really see the impact of what it's like to not be on drops or to be on fewer drops. And I feel like so many times in glaucoma, we're trying to stave off progression, but our our patients don't really feel improved. And so um, intracameral bimatoprost is fun because it's an opportunity to actually help a patient feel improved um, to the extent that you can get them off drops or on reduced drops. And, um, and certainly the patients who struggle with compliance, whether it's because of early dementia or arthritis um, or just sort of you know, a lackadaisical attitude about therapy, um, it can really be a game changer for them. Um, and I'm seeing great results into the, you know, six month to one year, sometimes even a little longer um, duration. And so um, it's, it's certainly not for everyone. It's, I, I don't use it first line, um, but I'm very, very happy for the patients for whom it's appropriate. Yeah, I think of it like glaucoma is a marathon. We have a lot of tools in the toolbox. This is another one, and we're going to probably yeah. utilize most of these tools in the toolbox. And you may have touched on this, yeah. but do you do this typically in your, in your clinic at a slit lamp or are you doing this in the operating room? When do you, when do you typically do it? I do it at the slit lamp um, because I'm very comfortable with that. You know, I'm tapping eyes, adding Helon to eyes all the time. And so I think it's easy to do with the slit lamp. And in terms of my office flow, it's just much, much better. But I can imagine that for some people having sort of a scheduled day and maybe doing it in a procedure room or something would be easier for them. And that's, that's not the case for me. Kind of piggybacking on that question, sticking still with glaucoma drug delivery, 
Do you foresee as more of these procedures come out, more of these devices come out, whatever they may be, you did a wonderful review on that. Do these eliminate topical glaucoma medications or are we still gonna to continue to use topical glaucoma medications? Such a good question. I think topical glaucoma medications are here to stay. Um, you know, in, in particular, there are a lot of people that just don't need them indefinitely. Um, steroid responders, people with pressure spikes um, after surgeries, vitrectomy, cataract surgery, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of reasons why you might just be on drops for a short period of time. And those aren't the type of people for whom SLT or sustained release or or surgery or, um, are appropriate. And so I think we'll always want to have topical options. And it's a great way to expose people to medication also, especially people who've had a lot of sensitivities. Um, I'm not always enthusiastic about putting something in the eye if I haven't tested it on the eye. And so drops are nice for that also. Yeah, that's a great point. I didn't think about that. You know, the, the allergic piece or the, mm -hmm. will they, will they respond to something in a negative yep. way? It's a lot easier just to stop a drop, but if it's already in the eye, then that creates a little bit more of a challenge. That's right. You no, know, there was a great study you reviewed. And a lot of times when we think about glaucoma treatment, we think, well, it's drops or it's surgery, but you talked a little bit about obviously some nutritional things, which mm -hmm. was amazing and excellent to hear about, but then meditation and a couple yep. of questions had popped up in regards to meditation. And, you know, one was in that particular study, how often did they meditate? And then, you know, how many minutes per day or how long did they meditate in that particular study? So in that particular study, it was 45 minutes of mindfulness meditation a day. And I would say, if we think we have trouble getting our patients to use eye drops, good luck getting them to meditate for 45 minutes. But I think, um, you know, for the right patient, possibly that could work. And I think more than focusing on the duration of the medication, I think it's interesting proof of principle um, that things like stress are um, very much related to to bodily functioning. I think anyone who suffers from low back pain or jaw pain knows that when they're stressed, those things are worse. And so it's not a stretch to think that um, glaucoma could be worse or pressure could be higher during periods of stress. But, you know, that's been hard to demonstrate in the past. And so I think the evidence is growing that a, a holistic approach to glaucoma care and to our health um, is, is not a substitute for medical intervention, but an important um, supplement per se. Talking about, you know, quality of life and, and supplements and those types of things, you know, you, you mentioned in your lecture a lot about, uh, or spent some time about talking about preservative free glaucoma medications, mm -hmm. or at least um, uh, different preservatives, maybe other than just BAK. You know, our job as eye care providers is to make sure that our patients see for the rest of their lives when we're talking about glaucoma, we don't want them to obviously go blind on our watch. But I think you would probably agree that quality of life issues do matter as well. How often in your practice with your glaucoma patients, are you discussing ocular surface disease issues on top of the disease themselves? And when you do that, how do you have that conversation with your patients? Yeah, I'm discussing ocular surface disease all the time. Um, you know, whether it's tears or warm compresses or changes to therapies, um, I do think it's so, so important. And there have been studies that have shown that chronic dry eye pain is actually worse than chronic chest pain in terms of its impact on patient quality of life. So it's huge. And I think because glaucoma is a marathon and not a sprint, um, we're just not really able to have that therapeutic relationship with patients and really see them through um, you know, their entire life unless we meet them where they are in terms of their needs. Not every patient needs to talk about their ocular surface, um, but it's, it's really important. And when it bothers people, it's the thing they want to talk about the most. I always tell, you know, our residents and, and uh, you know, the externs that I train, I always say to them, you know, the patient that comes in that has glaucoma, they have a, maybe a small nasal step, let's say, for example, you're worried about that and you need to manage that. We want to make sure their pressure is under control. But I would argue that most of the time the patient doesn't know that they can't see that, that little spot in their vision. Yeah. The bigger concern to them is when their friend, when they're out at dinner or their, or their wife or their husband says, boy, why are your eyes so red? Or so why are you blinking? And, and, mm -hmm. and why are you looking like you're in pain? And, and so I do think, and I love that you put that in your lecture, the, the options that are available to manage that. So yeah. really appreciate your time. I can't think of a better way to kick off you know, eyes on glaucoma day two than to have you present this particular lecture. It's talking about the Thank future, you. keeps us all excited about, you know, managing and treating glaucoma. So thanks for your time. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful weekend. Great. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.